Hello everyone, this is Chris Martin with Half Hour of Heterodoxy, brought to you by Heterodox Academy. I'm here today with Professor Jacques Berliner Blau. He is a professor at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C., and we're here to talk about this book. It's Campus Confidential, How College Works or Doesn't for Professors, Parents, and Students. Uh, Jacques contacted us at Heterodox Academy, and he mentions us in the book. So welcome to the show. Uh, welcome, Chris, and I just want to say uh, thank you to you and thank you to Heterodox Academy, which is some great work for, for hosting me. Thank you. Thank you. So this book isn't entirely about politics. It's really a comprehensive book about several aspects, but part of it is about college and the distinction between liberals and far leftists. Mm -hmm. So can you start by talking a bit about that and why that's relevant? I'm going to talk about it in a softer tone than I would have pre-Charlottesville, right? So, okay. I mean, I mean, now I, I'm recognizing we have to be very, very careful what we say about the left, right? Because mm -hmm. uh, the left is not the problem as far as I'm concerned at this moment uh, right. in American history. The argument I was making in the book is um, uh, people like, like Bill Maher, strangely enough, or Fox News, mm -hmm. often think of American academic culture as they would think of American political culture. In American academic culture, we have red, blue, conservative, liberal, uh, Republican, Democrat. A binary, basic binary, right? And right. everything is stuffed into that binary. On a typical American college campus, in particular an elite liberal arts college campus, you actually have three factions. This is the argument that I wanted to make, right? Mm -hmm. A tiny, deplorably small cohort of conservative scholars, uh, something like 2% mm -hmm. of professors of English are registered Republicans. To me, that's mind boggling. Mm -hmm. You have a much larger cohort of liberals, a graying cohort of liberals, but the energy and the enthusiasm and the excitement is amongst what I would call the far left. And these might be readers of Michel Foucault, or they might be readers of Jacques Derrida, mm -hmm. uh, there may be some Heidegger in there, via Nietzsche, so on and so forth, post-structuralism, mm -hmm. post-colonialism, but we know the, we know the mm -hmm. drill. My argument is they're basically half to 60 to 70 percent of every major humanities department at every major college in the United States. So we have to be very cautious when we blame liberals for free speech policies on campus or for as far as I can tell, this generally doesn't emanate from liberals. Liberals share on college campuses a lot in common with conservatives in terms of their thinking on free speech issues. I feel the mm -hmm. energy for trigger warnings, uh, for speaker boycotts, right? For safe right. spaces, is coming from that large radical left camp. Can I say one more mm. thing? I'm sorry, I'm speaking. Sure. Of Those people are serious scholars, right? I have no. I'm not saying they don't belong. I mean, they don't deserve to be there. Really good. I've learned a lot from them. I just don't know why they're so big. Why there's so many of them, right? I go to a conference, <laughs> like a comp lit conference, and every single paper is about Walter Benjamin or about uh, you know Michel Foucault. I don't understand how that hegemonic uh, status was achieved by these groups. Mm -hmm. So well, in every discipline, to some degree, there's a canon of either important theories or important people. And what you're saying is there are some people on the left, specifically Foucault, perhaps, right. whose, whose importance maybe is more than it should be. How much Foucault can you take? I mean, I read Foucault in graduate school. I'm sure you do as well. When I was getting my experience, I liked it. I thought it was good, right? Mm -hmm. But quickly understood, it's kind of a, was it Karl Popper that called it a, no, it was um, uh, Goffman who called it a total institution, right? right. I mean, yeah. you get into this system and there's like no way to get out. Mm -hmm. And it invariably shunts you to certain political conclusions. It, this is what I don't like. We're both sociologists. So when I studied Weber, they were right Weberians and they were left Weberians, right? Uh, when I read Hegel, I came to realize they were right Hegelians and they were left Hegelians, like Bruno Bauer and Karl Marx, right? Right. Who doesn't permit that big right-left birth? Like, how many right Foucauldians do you know, right? Foucault, free market Foucauldians. Right. Okay. Foucauldians that love the Israeli defense forces. I mean, it just doesn't happen. So I think the theory kind of, like, aggressively sluices you Right in a very particular and I think a little bit odd political direction. Mm -hmm. So, what advice would you have for either potential grad students or potential undergrads who are going into the humanities and social sciences? All right. So, different advice for different people. Uh, let's start. Let's start with graduate students. Right. Um, 
My greatest advice that I could give to a graduate student in the humanities is don't go, don't go, please, please don't. But I don't want to be that guy that gives that advice because mm -hmm. in the 90s, there was some guy like me, some old fuddy duddy, saying, don't go, there are no jobs. Don't. And I went anyhow, all right? So I'm mm -hmm. not going to sit here and tell somebody not to do what I did. Mm -hmm. I do think graduate students in the humanities have to be extremely cognizant of the odds against them snagging A, the tenure track job, or B, a tenure track job at a place that is remotely desirable. I mean, or to get a tenure track job anywhere in the United States right now is like hitting the jackpot, all right? It's really, mm -hmm. really hard. But often the jackpot is this university out in Bumble, whatever. You know, it's just an awful teaching environment, and there's really not much there uh, for a person to want. So, to the hardworking graduate students in the humanities out there, I pray for you, I honor you, but think a little bit about the 10 years. On average, it takes 10 years to complete a doctorate in the humanities that you're going to invest in this, and think that out on the other side, your prodigious talents might not be recognized precisely because there are so few options, opportunities to recognize your prodigious talents. Um, undergraduates, that's their undergraduates and parents, because parents are often involved in the high school uh, senior selection process. I think they have to ignore college ranking systems, put the U.S. News and World Report to the side. I mean, don't look at these listicles, right? They're anti-intellectual. The data is way off. The metrics have nothing to do uh, with the quality of the, of the education. And to me, what is important at a college, what makes college college is that unique encounter in the classroom between professor and undergraduate. And we, this is my generation, not your generation, mm -hmm. we have failed in that regard. All right? We have really, really failed to keep up the standard and the tradition of undergraduate teaching, and I'm blaming the tenure line folk in particular, where we believe that research is really what we need to do. So to parents, what I humbly say is look for these out-of-the-way schools, right, where the faculty, they, they all have doctorates from Princeton, Yale, Chicago, anyhow, Emory, they, it's, I mean, every tenured professor in the United States is pretty good in the humanities. They have a good pedigree, right? Mm -hmm. so, Maybe look at these small schools, I call them slacks, or honors colleges. Honors colleges is a new development in American higher ed. So you have a big state university and somebody carves out uh, a little institution that takes the very best teachers and concentrates their, them there, weaponizes them, and incentivizes them right, to work with undergraduates. So I think those are great values for the dollar, and they just might be charting a roadmap to the future of what might work uh, in American higher ed. Okay. And one thing I appreciated about your book, among many things, and I would definitely recommend this book to anyone who's considering a career in academia, but the very first chapter, it's a bit of a short novel before you get into the more traditionally nonfiction style of writing. It's a, it's a bit like a short Tom Wolfe novel. And I think I appreciated how it really puts you in the shoes of someone who's doing a PhD. I think that's really helpful for someone who's maybe considering doing a PhD in the humanities. I think the sciences are different. STEM is different. STEM is good. I mean, go for it, man. And economics, go for it. There are all these great consulting gigs to be had as an economist, but you're absolutely right. The humanities, don't go for it. I'm sorry, you were saying? Well, I was saying it's a good description, too, of why some people in the humanities take eight, maybe even ten years to finish their PhD. Often going in, people don't understand why that's the case, but I think you explain why that sometimes happens and why you experience frustration as well in the process. Yeah, I want to thank you for being the first person to interview me. I've done 25 interviews in 40 days on the radio. You're the first person to mention that a fiction breaks out in chapter one. Like nobody notices it. So I say to okay. people, did you like the book? They say, yeah, I love the book. And did you happen to notice that there was a fictional story that was inside? What fictional story? I thought that was about you. Like, no, that's not about me. I'm a professor of comparative literature. I wrote a little beautiful 2,500 word fictional story. Um, I really was trying to create a scenario that describes the despair that sets in uh, for graduate students. And this is what I think is all going wrong, right? Everything that was charming about you is being mercilessly extricated from you, right, by this process. So you went in there and you're kind of a hipster and you had a you know kickball team and you were like a fun guy or fun girl. And now you're in this environment which is weirdly competitive because there are no jobs, right, which sequesters you in an archive for hours upon end, which makes you deal with text, which we all do, which is a solitudinous experience, right, and which focuses you on issues that nobody else cares about. 
and run that program for 10 years. And you're going to create what I call a fuddy-duddy, or you're going to create a sort of defective human being. And I did this twice, all right? So I went to graduate school two times. So I'm doubly defective uh, in that regard. Now, the link to the undergraduates there, I think, is important. I think that what we do to our humanists in graduate school basically makes it impossible for them to ever be capable of teaching undergraduates. Right? It, the process strains out the teacherly impulses, the empathy, the emotional intelligence, the ability not to focus maniacally on one side, all the things that good teachers do, sense of humor, right? sobriety, probity, right? all this stuff is gone after year five of graduate school. So my book is a little more radical than I think people understand, probably because it's pitched as comedy. I mean, it's a book that's, made, that's supposed to make you laugh, but comedians, if you speak to them, believe what they're saying is dead serious. Right? So I would like to think that one thing that could emerge from this book is a conversation about completely reconfiguring what we think a scholar is and what a scholar should do. Like the ontological status of a scholar should be rethought because right now it's not working. And we know it's not working because there are jobs and our guild is done. Mm -hmm. We'll talk a bit about your suggestions, both the facetious ones and the not so facetious ones. Thank you for mentioning the facetious. The most facetious one is close down every graduate school in the humanities for 10 years, all right? Every one of them. And we'd have a, a uniformed force. And Chris, if you want to help me design the uniforms, we could do this together, right? But I just want kind of men and women in uniform going to this elite university graduate program and bolting it. And then they come mm -hmm. back with flashlights to make sure that nobody's going in. All right, so it sounds facetious, but what would happen if we didn't produce any more doctorates in French literature for a decade in the United States, right? All those poor, hard-working contingent faculty that did not land a job between 2007 to 2017, all of a sudden, they are competitive again for the few jobs in French literature, let's say 19th century, right, that are out there, right? So I'm creating a beautiful American job, all right, by, <laughs> by closing down uh, these graduate schools. I know that sounds a, a little bit like a, um, well, it's an awfully strange thing to say. Anyhow, so that's kind of a facetious way of looking at it. More serious suggestions uh, are that we as scholars, and that means you as you are joining the guild and training to be one of us, we think much more conscientiously about our responsibilities towards undergraduates and the administrators be damned. All right? It doesn't matter if the administration isn't properly equipping us or paying us. Right? Our first moral obligation, like a doctor's obligation, is do no harm and take care of the patient. Right? Our obligation as professors is to educate those 18 to 24 year olds whether we like them or not. That's our heroism as scholars. I'd really like to see uh, a, another group like Heterodox Academy emerge, right? And a group that cuts across political lines because good teaching, it's on the far left, it's on the right, uh, it's in the center, right? A good teacher can be from anywhere. I'd like to see a national advocacy group for serious undergraduate teaching and I'd like it to emerge from the elite schools, right? Because I do feel the second and third tier schools often have a much better handle on what is going on instructionally in their classrooms than the top 50, let's say. All right. Well, the top 50 definitely draw from a certain socioeconomic class, which, which well. makes them different. In terms of the students, you mean? Or the yeah, types in of terms of the students. Yeah. yeah. In terms of I have a theory, Chris, um, that the reason why active learning techniques are so popular now, have you noticed that? Like, People are actually starting to move towards active learning. I don't think it's because of us. I think it's because of the, um, the uh, income inequality in the United States. In other words, at Georgetown University, which is a top 20 school, I guess, right? Um, mm -hmm. A lot of our kids are wealthy, right? And they come from very privileged backgrounds, and they went to excellent schools. And at those excellent schools, on the high school level, uh, the lecture format was... Uh, a non-starter, right? They never had a teacher that lectured them. It was all conversation, and these people were trained in getting small classes of 15 kids or so, right, to talk seriously. I think that was the driver of the revolution at the elite schools, right, where now some professors on every campus are experimenting with these active learning techniques, and they're abandoning the passive model. I don't think it happened because we wanted it. I think the, the clientele basically said, this is ridiculous, all right? We don't want to listen to Professor Blowhard lecture for 75 minutes, right? Only pouring right. a sip of water. So I think it came from below, and it's a great revolution. I just don't know if it's too little too late.
Maybe. I mean, I know there's been a constructionist movement in the educational world, too, and the people who do the philosophy of education. Mm -hmm. And I think that's been working on this issue of active learning for a while. But mm -hmm. it could be it could be bottom up driven as well. Yeah, so, I, I, I think you mentioned these professors of education. I do a riff in the book where I talk about how disrespected they are. Right. Um, by buffoons like me, or like so people in the deep humanities, right? The people that come out of ancient languages or classics, right? And we always look at these PhDs in education as these second-rate imbeciles, and we don't want to hear from them. And we're wrong. It's a huge mistake, all right? They have tremendous knowledge to impart about how people learn. But the go-to joke on a liberal arts faculty or the go-to snark always goes to them. Ah, it's just the school of education. They don't know it. I think yeah. they have to start listening to um, professors of education much more carefully. That's what I learned writing this book. Okay. So going back to the political side, do you think graduate schools might become more relevant if they actually start addressing this issue of, of, of a lack of political diversity? And maybe that would somehow make them more relevant to to, to non-academic positions, to, to PhDs? What would happen, she, I think you and I are very similar on this issue, and I think Heterodox Academy, I think we all agree on this. I, I don't necessarily want a right-wing or left-wing professor. I don't think that's what Heterodox Academy is after, right? I yeah. want a professor whose views are either inscrutable, right? You cannot, political views, right? You do not know what their politics are, right? Or completely unpredictable. And the reason that that happens is because when they enter the classroom, they're not thinking red, blue, Democrat, Republican. They're thinking, I'm a student of symbolic interactionism. And symbolic interactionism teaches me, right? And this is how I approach it. That's what I love about college, that we don't think in these stark political terms, right? We come with these ancient disciplinary traditions, and that's what guides us, right, to come to occasionally political conclusions. So I, I think what's weird is step one for rectifying the problem, yeah, is to get more conservative folks of, of goodwill and good conscience, right, into the account. Absolutely. Well, we're not going to make any progress until we do that. But my bigger dilemma is that's not really what I'm after, right? I'm not right. after, like, co cookie-cutter diversity. I want a faculty of nutcases. I love that, like brilliant nutcases. And I've always felt, for whatever reasons, I might be wrong, that only the University of Chicago, right, preserves that. I've always felt that university permits idiosyncratic professors to right. be as idiosyncratic as they wish, right? They can wear capes on campus to pull a scene out of Philip Roth. They it's just all yeah. this crazy stuff that, that they used to do, as we know, legends from the 60s and 70s. So I like a campus where the professors are there and they're teaching and they're weird. And nobody really knows what their politics are, all right? Because their, right. Politics, their scholarship is too complex, right? The freight of their thought is too complex to stand on this platform of Republican or Democrat. Interesting. So what do you think about professors who do talk about their politics but, but acknowledge that it's just one perspective among many and explain how they got to where they were? Yeah, I like, I, mean, I have no problem with that. I mean, I think it's cool. Look, students, undergraduates are not dumb, right? I, I feel they have, they all have these built-in bullshit meters, right? They know when a professor is snowing them or kind of soft peddling an issue. So from the start of my career, probably because I started teaching African-American and Latino students in the five boroughs, right? Where the bullshit mm -hmm. meters are like, like scientifically precise, right? I mean, mm -hmm. these are kids that don't like people. Uh, especially white dudes such as myself, lying to them, right? So I yeah. understood very quickly, I'm going to be really honest in the classroom. Uh, so I felt that I learned from them that they'd be more willing to engage with me if I honestly told them from the outset, this is my personal view, all right? But here is what my professorial disciplinary teaching tells me, I should tell you. Now let's begin the conversation. So I have no problem with a professor walking and saying, look, I'm a radical man of the left, all right? I belong to this and this organization. I want you guys to know that, and you don't have to agree, right? Uh, okay. And this lecture is going to go, this conversation is going to go where this conversation goes, and I really want to hear opinions uh, that are not my own. But do you know when this gets done? I mean, it's one thing to talk about classroom discussion. The secret weapon in creating a good 
class environment for diverse opinions is the syllabus, right? That's the secret weapon, especially on the 300 and 400 level, right? So I teach a course on American secularism that, that actually is my area of expertise. I put all the people I can't stand on there. Uh, really, people whose ideas I think are not only wrong, but maybe even dangerous, right? But it's okay. really important since they're major players in the field, right? They're usually in this radical left, and they're often kind of conservative evangelicals, right? And they, they strangely agree on, on a lot of things, right? So I put those ideas out there, I put them on the syllabus, and it makes for a much better class because the kids aren't saying to themselves, oh, this Berliner Blau, he's just an old school liberal, he's a separationist, separation of church and state, right? Right. It, it does wonders for the vibe in the class, and it's good for me also, right, to kind of present arguments that I don't agree with, but give them the best possible presentation. That's a true scholarly virtue. I can't stand this person personally, hate that guy, right? don't like his scholarship, right? Uh, I think it's wrong, but let me try to make the most generous reading of it possible and then we can have a discussion. That's, that's interesting. No. Sorry, could you repeat that? I think that's like a really good teaching strategy and I'm not the only one that uses it, obviously, right? Mm -hmm. I, I remember yeah. professors from, who used to do this and it was cool and it just took the tension out of the room, right? I mean, everybody was just trying to work towards uh, new truths as opposed to a truth. Interesting. I think one issue with Foucault is, is that often Foucault is assigned and then you study people. Well, you, in the syllabus, you're assigned to read people who are the intellectual descendants of Foucault, but rarely assigned to read people who are serious critics of Foucault. In fact, you might you could get a degree in sociology without knowing that there are Isn't some serious a, critiques of Foucault. The best thing, I don't know if you do this in your graduate program, your medical sociology, you told me? Uh, right? Sociology of mental health. Sociology yeah. of mental health. We had a tradition in social sociology grad school called stacking, right? And stacking was we would take our basic intro course and learn 15 theorists. You know, I mean, not super well, but you had Marx, you had Durkheim, you had Weber, you had Pareto, you had Parsons, you had Hannah Arendt, right? You had Foucault. Right. And then across the breadth of your graduate education, a professor would say, give me a Marxist take on that one, all right? Give me a Durkheimian take on this issue involving mental health, right? Right. And it was a great exercise because we weren't being told, right, advocate on behalf of Foucault or Durkheim, right? Show me how this theorist would approach this cluster of contemporary problems. So I don't know if they're still doing that in graduate school, but one thing I loved about getting that doctorate in sociology was being able to master these like silos, right? So you mastered, I think I mastered four or five silos. I became really good in Durkheim, really good in Durkheim, like really good in Weber. I've forgotten a lot. Pretty good in Marx. And a problem would come up, right? And then I would try to attack the problem through Weber, Marx, Durkheim, later Hannah Arendt, who had a huge influence on me, and then Goffman, who I liked, because who doesn't like Irving Goffman? He's so fun. Right. So yeah. I think mean, that's a great way to educate graduate students. It's neither left nor right. Uh, if we could balance out the heteropatriarchal aspects of it, I get it. If we could diversify it, but we now have the resources to do that, then I think we're good to go. I think one thing schools are still doing is when they assign you prelims or comps, they try to make you, you know, look through various lenses at one particular issue. But I have no idea how much variability there is, there is across schools. And there's definitely a divide, so to speak, between the more philosophical side of sociology, which uh, you know, is more focused on the theorists like Marx and Durkheim and Foucault and the more empirical side. And there's a bridge between them. But I feel like some schools are also far more focused on the empirical so yeah. analyzing data sets and testing hypotheses much like much as you would in say psychology what you say is true and it's bigger than you may even know i'm finding the the big fissure right the big rupture in my intellectual world is between the quantitative and the qualitative people i don't ever recall it being this pronounced but more and more university resources are going to the quantitative folks, right? And the interpretive social sciences and the humanities, those of us that don't work with numbers, I mean, I failed trigonometry, all right? So I am not ready to do a regression analysis, which I don't even know what that is, right? Um, I, those of us that can't do numbers and don't do numbers and don't think that way are losing a battle, a long-term battle in the academy for influence uh, and the ability to steer the next generation the way they think. I mean, I, I feel all things equal, everyone would just rather have an economist, right, and her data, 
right, uh, than a scholar of, uh, you know, Balzac or Flaubert, all right? I mean, who needs them, right? What do they do? What do they provide the world? So this is a huge fissure, and it's just another one of those things we never thought about 20, 30 years ago, and now it's coming to bite us. Yeah, that's an issue. I think some of it's related to money, to take maybe a Marxist take on this. Right. You can get, if you're a sociologist who works with that kind of data, you can get grants from the NSF, and then some of that goes towards your university. Yeah, uh, yeah, but man, do those numbers people lord it over us. Oh my gosh. I mean, they, they really make us feel like a bunch of freaking imbeciles. I mean, that, that's the thing about it. They've gotten very, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? They've gotten really okay. contentious and imperious of late. Like, you guys yeah. are worthless. It's you that's destroying the universe. In 10 years, you're not even going to exist. So there's this feeling amongst humanists that yeah, maybe they're right. Or maybe we are completely worthless and have nothing to offer uh, All right. America. Yeah. Well. I feel like my department at Emory has done a good job balancing the two. I mean, I'm more of a numbers person. I came into this from psychology, which is, which is very much numbers oriented. But I think that's part of the heterodoxy you need too. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that's not really political per se, but it's a form of heterodoxy, where if you learn the qualitative side, you get into people like Durkheim right. and and Weber, um, whom you would really not engage with if you were right. just doing quantitative work. Right, 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 right. But there, there are aspects to Durkheim in particular. I once had an anthropologist, Theo Beidelman, I studied with. I remember him saying, when I first studied Durkheim the first time, I thought he was crazy. And everybody thought he was going and, and then after 10 years of studying Durkheim, I realized he was stark, raving mad, right? And the more right. I read Durkheim, I was like, yeah, this guy's nuts. I mean, it's fascinating, right? It's such an esoteric blend uh, of a whole bunch. Uh, of different things, but uh, one thing I do want to, as we talk about the academy, uh, the economist now is like the cool kid in uh, higher ed. In the 60s, it was a sociologist. So you think of C. Wright Mills, uh, for example. Right? So you have all these sociologists that are writing these like thunderous denunciations and debunking everything. That was a, in the 80s, it was a literary theorist. It was like Stanley Fish and the shop he set up at Duke, and then you had Demand over there, and yeah, right? I think in the 90s it was like cultural studies, maybe. And then came the 2008 meltdown, right, financial implosion. And all of a sudden, everybody wanted to hear economists, right? Paul Krugman, after all, has this nice, well-deserved spot on the op-ed page of the New York Times. So I feel that the economists got this huge push in 2008, right? And now they're amongst the, the most important and interesting folks on a college faculty in the United States and elsewhere, right? the other group that really came up in that period were the evolutionary biologists. Right? So those two cohorts just became very, very kind of central right? Uh, and seen as really representing what a university does. Uh, these, also these neuroscientists were in there. And I repeat, the little English professors, right, the cinema studies people, the French lit people got steamrolled. Uh, they're like collateral damage. Nobody cares about them. Nobody cites them. If you look at their Google citations, they're in the dozens, right? If you look at right. economists, Google citations, like 23,000 citations. I just find that very, very funny. Wow. Anyhow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, to bring it back to a topic you mentioned, we should probably wrap up in a few minutes. But to bring it back to the issue of secularism, we've now seen quite a few people saying that the far left ideology has, has taken on um, the aspects of a religion. And you can see that at certain universities. Right. And that tends to be, that, that perspective tends to come from, let's say psychologists and, and maybe sort of general commentators. But as someone who studies secularism, do you think it's appropriate to draw a connection between some leftist activism or do you think that's misguided? The first thing is that everything's different now, right? I mean. I'm not worried about the left today, right? I'm really worried about the right, all right? Uh, as I'm sure you are as well. I'm like terrified about what is going on uh, in the country post Charlottesville, and I should have been aware of this a long time ago and thought about it, right? So, so the academic left, I want to say this, for all the things I dislike about them, has not shown itself to be violent or unlawful in any way, shape, or form. So reasonable people can disagree. Is it a religious worldview? I think the Marxists were that way in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Um, the Foucauldians are so hard to figure out, right? Like, I want to write a novel about a Foucauldian. I don't know if there is a... I just don't understand what makes them tick. I don't know what they're after. I think I know. Yeah. But 
you know, one critique of Foucault, I know it's not one, you hear it all the time. It's like, what does the guy want, right? How many times have you heard a graduate student say it's really interesting and it reads like poetry in a way, right? But what does he want? When you read Pierre Bourdieu, you kind of know what the guy wants, right? Because he, I think, is a master of theoretical discourse, right? Bourdieu, you read Bourdieu, like, oh my God, he wants a lot. And I never knew what Foucaultians want. So in the realm of secularism, what do they want? Or they hate uh, separation of church and state. They hate secularism because they see it as a ruse of enlightenment modernity, all right? They see it as a stratagem of power, right? That colonizes and oppresses uh, populations within Europe and outside of Europe and marginalizes religion. Okay, I get it, and there's there's some validity to that. But what's the solution? Okay, so let's say we get rid of secularism. And if you corner a Foucauldian, right, or postmodern, post-Foucault, post-colonialist, they often end up, to use the terms of one of my dear departed colleagues, repristinating medieval forms of governance. Like they like empire a lot. They're crazy about empire, right? Like well, big multicultural empires, like um, you know the Ottoman Empire. They're always talking about the Mughal Empire in India, which were yeah, they were cool empires. There were a lot of good things there, right? But their solution, their reflex is to always go back to things that are pre-modern, right? Because of their hatred of the modern. I don't see how we're going to put that into play. Like I've never understood what applied Foucauldianism looks like, right? When you put it into application, it seems like a very interesting theoretical system. I don't see how anything is created. So are they religious in their thought? No, I'd say more of the um, the kind of dogmas, like the knee-jerk anti-Israel, anti-Zionism stuff, right? Where it's just absolutely impossible to speak to people. You just can't have a conversation with them about the complexity of Israel-Palestine. I see this a little bit with India-Pakistan, but I don't know that world well enough when these issues swell up, like people just can't talk about them. Um, ideally, the university should be the place uh, where really intelligent people who know a lot can talk about India, Pakistan, Israel, Palestine, right? Then they can sit in a room and they can just talk it out, right? And it happens so infrequently and that is you know, another one of our many failures, and we have not created that space in American civic society, civil society, uh, to have those conversations. All right. Well, I think one of the interesting things about American universities is as you get international students, you actually have, you know, domestic undergrads or local undergraduates um, mm -hmm. learning about these issues. Like, I came to the U.S. as an international student, and I think my roommate learned a lot about India thanks to me. Um, I'm not trying to praise myself, I'm just saying that's the kind of thing that happens when you when you have international students come in and you, as you have from India and Pakistan and from Israel as well. Yeah. Um, so when you, did you join like the Southeast Asian club? Did you join the Indian club or did you join the French club? I mean, that's a really interesting, like undergraduates join the club that they are. And in my generation, I went to uh, NYU in the mid eighties as an undergrad. That was like so uncool. You never did. You always joined the club that you weren't. Right. So, you know, you joined, uh, you know, a gay lesbian club. Right. Or you joined if you were me. Right. You joined the uh, African Studies Club and it was really accepted. It, it was not seen as cultural imperialism. Right. Or condescension. And something flipped. Right. As I look around any college campus. Right. The clubs are really affinity groups. Right. And the affinities are often like ethnic or religious markers. Uh, and I don't know, I don't know what you can do about it. I mean, I like when people get together, voluntary associations, we learn, reading the top field, right, are a good thing. But it's kind of sad, right? It's kind of sad that, uh, you know, the Muslim student doesn't join the Japanese club, all right? Must join the Muslim Students Association. The Jewish kid must join Hillel, right? I'd rather the Jewish kid joins the French club, right? Or, you know, something totally, totally different, or the club on First Amendment freedoms. But, yep, such as... Such is the state of the American college campus in 2017. Yeah, well, I feel like, yeah, to some degree that ship has sailed. I don't know no, if sorry. that'll turn around. But, uh, yeah, well, I think this is a good point to wrap up. Any final thoughts? No, again, I, I, I don't know if I mentioned it this time when we spoke, but I think Heterodox Academy has succeeded in doing what, there were many false starts, or there are many attempts to deal with some of these obvious issues. Uh, that you folks deal with, and they all failed. Uh, but you guys haven't, right? I'd like to know why, right? I mean, people actually listen to Heterodox Academy, they go to the website, and you've got a nice roster of professors. I don't always agree with everything you do, nor should I, but I just think congratulations on creating this forum that is taken seriously by serious people and has a lot of really great 
thoughtful folks in it, like yourself, Mr. Martin. Thank you for interviewing me. Well, sure. Thank you. Okay, thanks. All right, bye. Bye. Take care. Take care. Okay.